Felix here, Wall Street has screwed up the system, changed the rules, so only these 10 stocks will make money, everything else will basically fail. So not owning these 10 stocks is going to be waste your time and waste your money, and you need to understand why. I'll give you the three reasons so you can explain it to your golden retriever and make money, which is quite frankly the entire purpose of this community, isn't it? To get you to live the life you deserve. And for the same reason, I'm also running a free life trading training where I give you my entire strategy, how I'm up 73% ROCE, that's return on capital employed this year, 126% last year. You might be thinking, that guy is full of it. Well, I share every single one of my trades with my community. So come and ask me the difficult questions on Sundays. Make me squirm. I like to squirm and I'll explain and break down the whole structure and strategy and how I do it in three hours a week and enjoy myself. So let's get cracking, shall we? There we go. 10 companies in three sectors account for all of the gains of the S&P 500 so far this year. If it wasn't for, and these are ETFs names, and what are they? XLK is, let me pop it on the screen here for you, uh, is tech. The XLC is communications, and XLY is consumer discretionary. Okay, and I'll break down what, what those mean. Without those, the S&P, which is up like 18%, would be basically at zero. So we need to focus in on these and figure out what the heck happened there. But let me show you what they are. This is the tech S ETF. And what's in it? Well, it's 22% Apple, it's 21% Microsoft, it's 5% NVIDIA, and then a bit of other stuff. Okay, what about the next one? Well, you've got the communication services sector. This was obviously created sort of pre-internet. And what is it? Well, it's 24% Meta. It's 13% Google. Oh, it's another 11% Google. It's 4.8% Activision, which is about to become Microsoft. So a little bit more concentration there at the top. And then you've got the consumer discretionary. You know what? You go out and you want to buy something you don't really need. That kind of thing. And what is that? Well, it's all Amazon and Tesla. And then it's basically planks of wood, right? But in terms of weight, it's all those guys. So what does that mean for us? Well, the top seven stocks, and we're talking about the top 10 here, I'll tell you what the other three are, at the moment account for 28% of the market cap of the S&P 500. And that isn't just because they're such great stocks, it's for three very good reasons. Why, though, are fund managers buying these stocks, which many people are saying are overvalued. I mean, the multipliers are kind of crazy. Like they're really like valued at, you know, near 2000 levels. Well, there are a couple of very good reasons for it. If you're a fund manager, your first job is what? Make money for your clients? <laughs> no. Um, how about really outperform? No. Beat your competitors? No. Um, anything else you can think of? Basically, don't stick your neck out. Don't get fired. That's your job. Because let's face it, your customers are too misinformed to realize whether you're a Muppet or whether you're a genius. So they just leave your money, their money in the fund, some random ETF usually, because they don't know where else to go. So how do you not stick your neck out? You don't underperform your benchmark. So if your benchmark is the SPY or it's, you know, SP, uh, whatever, one of the subsectors, right? The Ks, the Cs, the Ys, uh, like the ones we had on the chart here at the top. If that's your benchmark, why don't you just buy the benchmark? That way you can't lose. You're not going to get fired. You will not massively underperform like 95% of fund managers do. So you just buy the benchmark and then you'll tweak a little bit to make yourself look special. And then that's usually what makes you underperform. But because everybody else is an idiot, no one's going to fire you. That's reason number one. The second reason, and this is really what I want to get into here, is the ETF effect. How much money do you have in an ETF? Well, most people have most of their money now in ETFs. We now have something like, uh, it's a little small, isn't it? 6.5 trillion, 7 trillion, something like that. 6.5 trillion dollars in ETFs. 
And why did it decline? Well, the stock market took a little bit of a beating from the peak of 2021 and, and people sold at the top. Sorry, sold at the bottom, bought at the top. That's unfortunately also how this works. And how many ETFs are out there? Well, there are about 4,700. And that's the blue line here. Let me get a blue pen. This is how many ETFs there are, right? So they're going through the roof because it's profitable, right? You do very little and you make money. In other words, out of the, um, this is a quote. I guess these are, I thought they're 4,000 ETFs. Cumulative number of ETFs launched. Yes. So, sorry about that. It should be a four. In other words, out of the roughly 4,700 ETFs, the top 10 stocks in the index comprise 25% of all issued ETFs. And given that for an ETF issuer to sell your product, they need good performance. They basically need to buy what makes up most of the index. So they can't not buy the top 10 stocks. So therefore, the money keeps flowing into the ETFs. And let's run through the numbers here. If you put a dollar into an ETF, like an SPY or something like that, 32 cents goes directly into the top 10 stocks. The remaining 68 cents gets divided by the other 490 poor bastards in that index. So what are you getting? 3.2 cent per top 10 stock, assuming they're equally weighed, which they're not, but you know, you get the idea. And then every other stock gets 0.14 cents. So the top 10 stocks get 23 times more ETF money than anybody else, and therefore they'll keep going up. As they keep going up, the ETFs have to buy more of those because they need to match the index and more money flows into them. Therefore, they go up more, more ETFs buy the same stocks and you get the Ponzi scheme idea. I mean, it's like a pyramid, right? As long as everybody buys, it goes up. Well, what happens if it doesn't go up? Let's look at that in a second. There's a third reason, though. I promised you a third reason, didn't I? I thought I did. If not, it's the bonus reason. Smaller companies are having a bit of a tough time with something called interest cover. And what is interest cover? How much cash do you basically bring in as a multiplier of the debt you pay? How easy is it for you to service your debt? And the smaller companies down here, are start. these are the smaller companies, are starting to struggle. Whereas the top 10% of the S&P, that's your top 10. Well, sorry, top 10. These guys, they're having it, finding it pretty easy, right? They've got lots of money. They can issue as much debt as they want. They're very profitable. They can gobble up any old competitor who looks decent, like Microsoft and Activision, for example. And therefore, if you're a smart fund manager, why would you buy the stocks that are possibly going to go bankrupt when you could just buy the Magnificent 10? Well, you're going to buy the Magnificent 10 because you don't have to then sit in front of investors and go, yes, I bought a stock. It went out of business. I'm an idiot. No, just went, I bought Microsoft. I bought Apple. I bought NVIDIA. I bought Google. I mean, Amazon, no one's going to argue with you on that, right? So the easiest place for fund managers, your smart institutional money is to put cash into mega cap companies with low risk of bankruptcies. And that's precisely what they're doing. That's reason number three. Now, let's see, say we get a recession and investors panic because they always do. And I show you uh, what you can do actually at the end here to really learn something from this and make money from this. And of course, I'll show you the top 10 list as well. What do they do when the investors panic? Well, they will sell their ETFs. So what happens then? ETF fund managers now have to sell some of their mega cap stocks because an ETF every single day buys or sells depending on inflows and outflows by their investors, right? So they're selling. Question then is, well, all ETFs will be selling because the share price of your Microsoft's new Apple's new Google's will go down and they're all selling at the same time. So who's buying it? Is there some glorious, magnificent, you know, bailout ETF that's going to buy it? Probably not. So what happens? Who's the buyer? Well, someone will buy. There is always a buyer. The question is, at what, what price? And it'll be a very, very low price. So therefore, the next sell-off will be a stampede. And this is not doom and gloom, it's just logic. 
what happens is there is going to be somebody with money who will take Microsoft and Apple shares off you, but at a whopping discount. And if you ever looked in your brokerage, what you've got is there is a bid and there is an ask price, right? So say the ask price, this is your seller, this is your ETF, and this is your buyer, this is your cockroach. And the seller will say, I want $500. And the buyer will say, well, I'll give you $350. And the difference is usually where we meet. So that's $150 difference. So we take $75 in the middle. So maybe, maybe, maybe they'll settle here or somewhere down below. So your gaps and the speed speed at which the stock prices will fall will be faster than ever. And I think it is going to make 2022 March COVID crash look like an absolute picnic. So the lesson is therefore, this was March 2022. I just wanted to remind you what that looked like. Basically, what happened is more or less all stocks went down minus 30 percentage points. With the size of ETFs accelerating again and again and again, these moves are going to get bigger, much bigger, because everybody sells because everybody sells. And because they sell, the ETFs have to sell. Therefore, more retail investors freak the heck out. Therefore, they sell the ETF and the ETF manager has to sell the underlying stocks. The stocks go down, it's a vicious circle, right? You get the idea. So, there are a couple of lessons I want you to take away from this. And it's not being freaked out and just generally going, oh my God, it's all doomed. Let's bury ourselves in the basement. No, take the gold with us and a few sardines of tins, tins of sardines even. This is the stock market since, 90, uh, since 1870. And in 1890, sorry, people were worried about the depression and railroad strikes. Uh, the Boer War in South Africa broke out sometime late in that century. Uh, there was a rich man's panic. That must have been interesting. There was the panic of 1907. Um, you know, there was all sorts of stuff. Um, World War I, influenza, the 1929 crash in the Great Depression. And what's the point with all this? The Cuban Missile Crisis in Vietnam and Black Monday and Lost Decade and everything else. If you just held, didn't bottle out like a ninny, you would have made money. Sometimes you need to wait quite a long period of time. But what you want to be doing is if there is a crash, you want to wake up your wife or your golden retriever and say, you know what? It's the most glorious day ever. The stock market has just crashed. You know what we're going to do? We're going to get together all of our cash. We're going to make loads of extra money in the next couple of weeks. And we're going to buy the big stocks because at some point the market's going to turn around and we will have bought at one of these opportunities where the market was really, really, really cheap. And everyone else will be like, oh my God, do you remember what so-and-so did when the market crashed? He was so smart. That's what I want you to do. I want you to get one of these sheets and print them out and put them on your fridge. I want you to tell your children about them, your Labradors about them, so that they understand what's, what's going on here. And here's another one. This one's for, you know, your children too. The emoji cycle of investing. And it's, it's the most important chart there is for investors. You start with, should I buy, should I not? Then the market goes up, you get optimistic, then you get excited. The market goes up a lot, you're exuberant. You're telling all your friends about how much of a genius you are, how much money you made last week on Tesla or Palantir or whatever. The market goes down a little bit and you're like, yeah, it's not happening, not happening. No, no. Then you get a little bit fearful, you stop talking to your friends, you spend more time in the dark basement, and then you become desperate. Panic sets in and then you capitulate and you sell because you say, what have I done? I shouldn't have put all my money into this unprofitable biotech fund that no one's ever heard of, right? That was my story, 1999. And then you become despondent and depressed. You consume more Bud Light, even though you know you don't want to drink it. You become apathetic. Uh, then you become a little bit of hopeful because you've seen a pretty girl and then the market starts to go up again and you feel relief. But you're back to reluctance, so you're not buying. So you're waiting a little bit longer and you're buying up here. So what have you done? You've sold down here, you're buying up there, and the only people who are laughing are your broker because they made money regardless. Put this on your fridge, guys. 
This is important. Opportunity lies there. Risk lies there. Right? Just Google. Cycle of investing. You'll find it online. So should you only own these 10 stocks? And let me put them on the screen here for you. So it's a bit dark, isn't it? <laughs> Okay, what are they? They're Apple, Microsoft, NVIDIA, Google, Meta, Amazon, Tesla, Berkshire, uh, arguably, which is lots of Apple, lots of energy, lots of insurance, but again, you know, Apple. And that's not, not, not 10 stocks, is it? That's nine stocks. Uh, is it eight stocks? Two, four, six, eight, yes. Now, most ETFs have Google as number four and as number five because there's Google Class A and Google Class C uh, for whatever reason. What's the, what's the next one out there? You can argue about this. I would argue it's LLY, which is actually a great company. It's V for Visa. Some people put UNH or XOM, United Health, or Exxon so on down there. Um, up to you, really. But these are the largest 8, 9, 10, 12 stocks out there that will get the vast majority of money allocated to them. And I think the these four, six, seven are definitely the, the, the most reliable in terms of money inflow. So does that mean you shouldn't ever own anything else? Well, I think that the time of stock picking is becoming harder. I think the way ETFs are just spreading like a disease, it means you have to own these. It's not financial advice, but I still think you have to own these. And then if you want to buy something else, you can. But if you don't own these, you will miss out on the majority of money inflow into the market, right? Every dollar that comes in, these guys get by far the most of it. Everything else gets a trickle. So I think it's important to understand. And I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you smash the subscribe button and you learn some more. And I have made another video for you where you're going to learn something Truly interesting. Let me play you a little clip. The US has $32 trillion of debt. $32 trillion. That's the whole GDP of China, Japan, Germany, and the United Kingdom added together. Crazy, hey? I mean, just bonkers. That's 